as Robert Burns demonstrated poetry holds up a unique mirror to a nation's heart, mind and soul. It's a pure language that tells us who we are. For centuries, Scotland's poets have encapsulated the state of our nation, yet Rabbi's shadow looms large. So this time, I look beyond Burns to some of the other extraordinary poets who have told and continue to tell our story. It's time they had their day in the sun. After all, how can one man speak for a nation? Here we are in this building of pure poetry in front of Her Majesty. Good day, ma'am. Ma'am, good day. Good morning, Helen and John Kay. Great believers in democracy and in giving it loudy. I'm Jackie Kay and I'm Scotland's Macker, the National Poet of Scotland. Macker is an old word for poet. It just means to make something. I love the way that, you know, you make a poem, you make a table, you make a pair of shoes. You know, all of us poets are mackers. I'm the third modern macker. Last Christmas, I was passing by a busker and I threw some money in his empty guitar case and he stopped singing what he was singing and went, it's the macker! I came back and told my mum this and she went, oh my, you've made it. <laughs> was asked to write a poem for the opening of the Scottish Parliament and that was probably my first big public poem back in 2016 and it was called Threshold. Let's blether some more about doors, revolving doors and sliding doors. I felt really strongly that I wanted the poem to be a great big welcome at a time when there was lots of xenophobia, racism and toxic attitudes in the air. So I decided to take the notion of door and of being on the thresholds and say, you're welcome here, we open the door. And this is my country, says the fisherwoman from Jura. Mine too, says the child from Kana and Iona. Mine too, says the brain family. And mine, says the man from the Polish deli. And mine, said the brave and beautiful Asid Shah. Me too, said the black Scot and the Red Scot, said William Wallace and Mary Queen of Scots, and mine, said the Syrian refugee. So there was a huge response in the chamber. Even the Queen seemed to clap. <laughs> clap quicker. The first poet I'd like to shine a light on is an extraordinary forever young man. Robert Ferguson was born in the old town in Edinburgh in 1750. He was a groundbreaking writer and Burns himself acknowledged that he would have not been the poet that he was without the early work and the influence of Robert Ferguson. He only lived 24 short years. Had he lived, it is arguable that Scotland would have had another bard. I find it Shocking that many people have never even heard of him. Hi, hey, James. Hello, Jackie. Isn't this amazing, this building? It's one of the most beautiful kits I've ever been in. I, I just love it. It's spacious and bright, and it's, it's of that time in Edinburgh when people were you know, living through the Enlightenment. So what do you think is the reason that, that we don't know of Robert Ferguson, because it was actually the last book I bought my dad, because he was passionately fond of Ferguson and he was always saying, I mean, Ferguson was a genius and Burns wouldn't have been Burns and Ferguson gets no attention. So it was one of his big things. I, I, I think he writes in a Scots that is very, very, it's quite complex and dense. I mean, Burns obviously writes in Scots too, but somehow Burns' Scots is a wee bit more accessible. He's most famous for the sort of 40 odd poems, which are mostly about, you know, the, the life in Edinburgh on the Edinburgh streets. And they were being published in the weekly magazine and people were desperate to read the latest Robert Ferguson poem. So his body of work for a man of 24 when he dies is really pretty large. Robert Ferguson was born in 1750. That's only five years after the last Jacobite Rising. 
and also it's less than 50 years since the union with England. So Scotland is going through a lot of big changes at this time. And the new town of Edinburgh hasn't been built yet. His father died when he was 17. So at the age of 17, he starts working as a, a clerk. And he does that for most of the rest of his very short life. The poem I'm going to read is called Braid Claith. And the message of the poem at one level seems really simple. It's basically saying, if you want to get on in life, get yourself a good suit of clothes. Yeah. Um, but it's much, much more subtle than that, because in fact he's saying, hold on a minute, if you dress yourself up, folk won't see some of your failings and faults. Ye who are fain to hear your name wrote in the bonny book of fame, let merit nay pretension claim to laurel wreath, but hap ye will both back and wain in good braid claith. For though ye had as wise a snoot on as Shakespeare or Sir Isaac Newton, your judgment folk would hae a doot on, I'll tack my ace, till they could see ye wi a suit on, a good braid claith. Wow. Isn't that fantastic? It's it so, loves it. it's so dexterous. It's so lines. tight. That poem's 250 years old yeah. and it's still just as relevant as, as, as if it was written yesterday. Right. There's no question that it's because Ferguson turns to writing in Scots that Burns, when he comes across Ferguson's poems, that he suddenly goes, oh, hang on a second. You don't have to write in formal English. You can actually write in your own voice. And here's a guy that's done it. And it's like a light bulb moment for Burns. He writes a letter to a friend where he says something like, I'd almost given up writing in verse until I came across the Scotch poems of Robert Ferguson, which made me restring my bow with emulating vigour. And that's where we get the outflow of Tia Moose and Tia Haggis and the Twa Dogs and all of these wonderful poems. Ferguson, he was on the one hand a man who clearly adored life and, and getting the most out of it, but he was also prone to, to doubts and he stopped writing poems. His friends didn't see him for a long time. Um, he burned some of his manuscripts and he ended up living in the lunatic asylum, which was known as the Bedlam. And this was not a good place to go. The place that, that, where he is kept is described as a cell. Um, it's pretty grim stuff. He's visited by a doctor called Andrew Duncan, and is really, really upset by uh, Ferguson's condition. And he just wastes away. And one morning, uh, one of the wardens goes in and Robert Ferguson is dead, lying dead in his cell. So it's a desperately sad end. Andrew Duncan, he later says that trying to treat Ferguson actually makes him realise that uh, there has to be a new way of dealing with people who are mentally unwell. And he sets up a new hospital out at Morningside and that becomes in time the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. So in that sense, not only was Ferguson a trailblazer for Burns, but he was also a trailblazer for mental health. When Ferguson was first buried here, it was in an unmarked grave. He was a pauper. And when Burns came to Edinburgh, he decided that a stone should be erected to Ferguson's memory, and this is it. The stone fell into some disrepair. Um, over the years, and it was towards the end of the 19th century that Robert Louis Stevenson decided that he would want the stone to be repaired and restored. And is by him rededicated to the memory of Robert Ferguson as the gift of one Edinburgh lad to another. Isn't that lovely? For each century, practically, uh, you've got a different part of the story. You know, all roads lead back to him, and he's the source, as it were. There's a wonderful statue just sitting outside this uh, kirkyard. It's by a sculptor called David Anand. There he is, heading down the cannon gate towards the Parliament. You're striding down the cannon gate, brent new, and looking like you've never been awa. We're never found curled deed upon the straw in Bedlam cells. You're twenty-four and foo, no claret foo, but o' your cell and life. Rat rhymes and habbies rattling through your head, a book in hon and hundreds mere to read. The world is yours, at least as far as fife. You'd ken 
and yet you wouldn't ken your tune. Some gains you'd praise, some losses you'd lament, say muckle change, say muckle aye the same. Old Ricky still as bra beneath the moon, and now we even hae our Parliament. Come home like you, Rob Ferguson. Come home. I was brought up with a really keen sense of democracy and of fighting for your rights. And I think I've taken that sense into the way that I've decided to be Macker. I am black and I'm Scottish, and there's no contradiction in that. When you're adopted, any life was possible for you. Thank God it was John and Helen Kay. I was adopted before I was born because my mum adopted my brother, and then she wanted somebody his colour to keep him company, which was quite forward thinking for the for 1960 and so the, the Scottish Adoption Agency said they would be in touch whenever they had such a child and they made a phone call to my mum and said there's a woman coming down from the Highlands and the father of the baby's Nigerian and my mum said I'll take that one <laughs> so she didn't know if I'd be a boy or a girl or healthy or well. My mum was a Scottish Secretary of the Peace Movement, my dad was the industrial organiser of the Communist Party so they were both kind of big figures but they were also really interested in culture so I was lucky. I grew up in a house where my mum and dad both loved poetry. So I had Norman McCaig in my house. I had Sorley McLean. I had Hugh McDermott. But the poet known as Hugh McDermott was an invention. He was born as Christopher Murray Grieve in 1892 in Langham in Dumfrieshire. He was a controversial figure and he restored a language to us in the form of Lalins. He's arguably the most important Scottish poet since Burns. I'm going to read you one or two very short poems in Scots, which will be quite unintelligible, I think, to all of you. And this poem says, One wet early evening, I saw that rare thing the broken shaft of a rainbow with its trembling light beyond the downpour of the rain. And I thought of the last wild look you gave before you died. A week for nicht of the yow trouble, I saw yon antrum thing, a water go with its shittin' licht a yon the yonding. And I thought of the last wild look you gave before you did. There was nae reek in the Laverick's hoose that nicht, and nae nae mine. But I hae thought of that foolish licht ever since I'm. I think that maybe, at last, I can. What your look meant then. Ah, huh. that gives and me the shiver factor. I've got the, the, I've got the poetry goosebumps <laughs> going up <laughs> It's, it's really a, a great pleasure to be here with you, Alan, in Hugh McDermott's home. And it still feels actually very much his home because the wee house is a monument to his roaring and interesting and complex ego. I mean, we're sat with all of these different uh, reproductions of the man and his famous head of hair. So it feels as if at any moment he could just walk in. I first heard of McDermott from a school teacher in Kent. This headmaster had said to me, you must know about this poet who's writing in Scotland now. He's writing in Scots. Find out about this man. I remember being uh, introduced to McDermott's poetry as a young girl because it was in the house. I grew up around it. But the very first time I would have met McDermott, weirdly enough, it would have been way, way before I would have ever remembered it, which was when I was five months old. Uh -huh. And I was just freshly adopted. That was the age that they yeah. got me. And they got me kind of straight out onto a demo. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's this amazing family photograph that we've got. And McDermott's pushing my brother oh, in, wow. the, in the pram. And my mum's holding me. Because it was before men pushed prams, as if to say, this is what a man does as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, a man pushes a pram. He was christened Christopher Murray Grieve. But when he started writing in the 1920s in Scots, he chose the name Hugh McDermott, partly because it was almost as if he wanted an identity not to hide behind, but to, to attack with. Almost as if it's not a nom de plume, but a nom de guerre. Most people 
don't understand poets. They see them as rebels against the system to which they themselves have automatically conformed. And that was what Blake meant when he said, all poets belong to the devil's party. The devil being the opposition to the social norms. He was a divisive character, wasn't he? Not just an innovative poet, but also a prolific cultural and political commentator and a founding member of the National Party of Scotland, today's SNP. You wouldn't have a Scottish Parliament today without Hugh McDermott. You would have no understanding of what independence actually means for Scotland without Hugh McDermott. Break up the empire, small nations are better than imperialism. And in, in political terms, back in those days, this was a crazy pipe dream. It made people think of it as a possibility in a way that they hadn't before, and the legacy of that is where we've got to. When I was here, McDermott had a, a huge pile of Morning Star newspapers stockpiled by the side of his uh, chair. And that sense of the revolutionary vision of what society could be, that was McDermott's as well. I'll hae nae halfway hoose, that I be where extremes meet. It's the only way I can to dodge the cursed conceit of being wrecked that damns the vast majority of men. I'll bury nae heed like an ostrich's, nor yet believe my een and naething else. My senses may advise me, but I'll be my cell, no matter what they tell us. I have this vivid memory of reading A Drunk Man Looks at the Thistle finding it in John Smith's old bookshop on St Vincent Street in Glasgow, taking it off the shelf, opening it up and going, this is, something's astonishing here. This is adult poetry. It's about politics, it's about sexuality, it's about history, and it's written in Scots. It's the language of my grandparents and my uncles and aunts. And David Dykes, the critic, said that this poem, when it was first published in 1926, broke on a flabbergasted Scotland with all the shock of a childbirth in a church. <laughs> <laughs> he had a good turn of phrase. And uh, in A Drunk Man's uh -huh. Looks at the Thistle, there's a real critique, really, of a certain kind of Scottishness, the kind yeah. of short-bred tin, yeah. the man in the kilt, the, the hook-eye, the new. And he felt as if um, the real message, if you like, in Burns's poetry had been distorted, if yeah. you like. He detested what he called the Burns cult. But what he's saying is we need to rethink Scotland in its entirety. And it's not one thing, it's not the little um, caricature, Harry Lauder type image. It's a multiple, multifaceted identity. He had a very, very different vision of Scotland and created his whole language that he called Lallans. Why did he call the language Lallans? Lallans is simply the word lowlands. He grows up in a lowlands community where Scots was a currency. So he's drawing on an older source of spoken Scots, sung Scots, and there was a whole sense of the confidence that could be built from the language that people spoke. He revolutionised Scottish poetry and what poetry and literature could do. And let this lesson be to be yourselves. You need no fash, gin it's to be ocht else. To be yourselves and to mark that worth being. Nay harder job to mortals has been gain. We are our influences, and I think for a lot of black writers in this country, we had to look further afield to find people that would do that amazing thing that you can get as a young writer, people that would hold up a mirror and tell you that you yourself can be possible. I started to read African-American writers and then I came across the work of Audre Lorde and it was an astonishing experience. She was one of the few openly black lesbian writers and I remember at the time I went through this, this period of being radically black and I was fed up at the kind of passive racism that I received all of the time. I told her I was annoyed in Scotland, <laughs> the whole country and, and she said to me, you know Jackie, you can be black and Scottish. You don't have to choose. And that was one of those electrifying moments in your life where I thought, oh my God. And so that was liberating. Thank you, Audrey.
So it's amazing Val being stood in front of this very, very iconic Poets Pub painting to just see who gets to be included inside the frame and yeah. who's outside the frame in this pub that's half Cafe Royal and half yeah. Rose Street. It's a, a pub full of men with their pipes and their fags and their drinks. Of course, the women are faceless and blurred. For me, it's like a teenage poetry reading list because these were the poets I was reading, the Scottish poets that I was reading in my teens. Norman McCaig there, and Edwin Morgan, Robert Garioch, Sorley MacLean, Hugh McDermott, of course, holding court. But if you took a handful of Scottish women poets, who would be in this painting? Well, I think you'd be there for a start. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> and, um... I wasn't fishing or anything. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We'd have Caroline Duffy and Kathleen Jamie. Yes. Who else would we put in? Nan Shepherd. Hannah Lavery and Nadine Aisha Jassat. And Liz Lockhead would Liz have Liz Lockhead, of poets. course, Liz would have to be there front yeah. and centre. Yes, we'd have Liz there. People yeah. will stone us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get angry letters from all the people we've forgotten in the moment. I'll paint my face up, paint the town, have Carmen nails or be a fatal dame. I've bold eyes, coal sockets. I look daggers kill. My lipstick colours merry hell. I'd frighten the French. I'll be a torment, haunt men's dreams. I'll wear my stockings black with seams. I'll rouge my cleavage, flaunt myself. My heels will be perilously high, oh, but I won't sway. I'll shrug everything off the shoulder. Liz Lockhead was born in Motherwell in 1947. She was a previous macker. She was Glasgow's Poet Laureate. She's also as well known for her plays as she is her poetry. She burst onto the poetry scene in the 1970s with a really groundbreaking and influential book, Memo for Spring, changing the lives of many different women Scottish writers who followed, including Ali Smith, Janice Galloway, Val McDermott and me. Here was a woman's voice that we hadn't heard from before in this very, very male uh, dominated poetry scene. I'll be a bad lot. I've a brass neck. There is mayhem in my smile. Even the way that she read and her rhythms really influenced what I felt I was able to do with my own poems. The rhythms I use are not meter. Meter is rhythm made regular and done to a pattern. Um, modern poetry is more often about trusting rhythm. Men talk, women chatter, women gossip, women play that. Men talk, men talk, men talk. Someone gave me Memo for Spring for my birthday in 1972, and it was just a moment of revelation. It was, it was fabulous to read poetry written by someone of my generation, but also written in the kind of language that I spoke and that I heard around me in the streets. I'd never thought of it before, that you could write in that way, that you could encompass that world of essentially working class life. Uh, and, and it was transforming. It made, it made possible for me to write some of the things that I write in the way that I write them. That wee book which you've got in your hands sold 5,000 copies. It was just kind of phenomenal. And she seems such a contrast to these older men, mainly. If you, if you think back to the, the other poetry books that were about at the time, yeah. they, were, they were all either an abstract cover or you know a line drawing of a boat or something like that. Yeah. And that was arresting. I know. She's beautiful. I know. I was taken along to hear her when I was 16, and I just thought, wow, you can read poetry in your speaking voice, in yes. your own voice, in your working class voice. You, you don't, don't have to have a special poetic yeah, voice you don't have to, to do declaim. Po <laughs> yes. But I just love the, the idea of that kind of working class breaking on um, to the scene and being proud, because for, for years, working class people were, were told to, to be quiet. Your mother, a machine that shat out siblings. Listen, everybody's mother was the original Frigidaire ice queen, clunking out the hard stuff in nuggets, mirror slivers and ice splinters that had stick in your heart. So I was sort of angry at that sort of way that a lot of us women have of becoming our own victims. And uh, I think a lot of these poems have got a kind of strident 
slightly frantic air, but it's the way I felt at the time. I must say, I feel a lot better for having written these poems. Um, I feel a lot mellower. <laughs> for years, we'd been telt about men's view of relationships and men's view of women. And here was the other side of the coin. Here was what it felt like to be a woman in the 1970s living in that world. And I, I remember reading this poem and just thinking, there's a universality to this because at one point or another, everybody's been dumped. How have I been since you last saw me? Well, I've never been lonely. I've danced at parties and drunk flat beer with other men. I've been to the cinema and seen one or two films you would have liked with other men. I've passed the time in amusement arcades and had one or two pretty fruitless goes on the fruit machine. I've memorised the patterns of miscellaneous neckties. Indifferent, I put varying amounts of sugar in different coffee cups and adjusted myself to diverse heights of assorted goodnight kisses. But my breasts, once bitten, shy away from contact. I keep a curb on mind and body. Love? I'm no longer exposing myself. <laughs> it's great. It's, isn't it? I, I love that sort of the. I'm having that. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm having a great time, me. And then it, that peels away, and we see what lies beneath. Yeah, and I love the miscellaneous neckties. She's fond of a necktie in a poem. She probably <laughs> put more neckties into poems than any other poet, living or dead. I wonder how many she's used to strangle people with. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, you. Another poet you'd like to talk about is Violet Jacob. What is it about her work that speaks to you? Violet Jacob, although she was very much from a posh background, the voices she chose to represent were the voices of working people, of poor people, of people in exile. She grew up um, in, in Angus, in a, a, the big house. But then when she got married, she went off uh, with her husband, because that's what you did, you followed your husband. And she, she, he was in the army, and so she went to India and South Africa and Egypt. And actually, she produced a pamphlet of poems when she was living in Cairo. And the military were apparently very suspicious of this, because it was written in Scots dialect. And that wasn't what, you know, the, the wives of, of officers did. And you also, for, for her, you get a completely different side of the story to say a poet like, like Burns. Um, because her experience, um, and, and women's experience generally, of being left pregnant by men yeah. is, is very, very different. Yeah, her grandmother was illegitimate, and I think that must have fed into her understanding of the world, because she's got, she's got a poem called The End of It, um, which is, if you like, a riposte to Burns loving them and leaving them, and his, his uh, tradition of, of getting women pregnant and then disappearing over a distant horizon. The End of It is a poem from the woman's perspective of, What's going to happen when, when her family find out? What's going to happen to the rest of her life? Well, that's basically it over. There's a fine broth thistle that lifts its croon by the river bank where the ashes stoned, and the swirl of water comes whispering down past birk and bramble and grazing land. But simmers flit it, and time's no heeding a feckless lass nor a pride for fleur. The dark to hide me is the grace I'm needing and the thistle seeding, and my day's hour. I read the hoose, and I meet the hens. Och, it's ill to work when you don't attire. And what'll I get when my mother kens? It's never a maiden that bigs her fire. I mind my prayers, but I'm feared to say them. I hide my een for their greeting fast. What though I blind them, for wha would hae them? The licht's gain for them, and my day's past. Oh, what axe tent for a fading cheek? No him as warrant that guard it fade. There's little love for a lass to seek when the curtain's through and the price is paid. Oh, ain's forgotten's forgotten fairly, and heavy end at what's licht begun. But God forgive you and keep you cheerly, for the nicht's fawn early and my day's done. As a young girl growing up in Bishop Briggs in, in Glasgow, I felt quite isolated and writing was my companion. I was a victim of a lot of racism. I mean, a boy was expelled from my primary school for making up 
sweets made of muds and shove them into my mouth and say that's what you should eat because you're from a mud hat. So that was my earliest experience of, of repeated racism and that was at age seven. When I went to university, there was fascists at the university then and they put up posters with my name on it at Stirling University. And it said, would you be seen with that Irish Catholic wog called Jackie Kay? For some reason they thought I was Irish Catholic. But they put up these posters and they put uh, razor blades behind the posters so that anybody that, that tried to rip them down would also get their, their hands uh, shredded. But then I remember responding to that by calling a public meeting because I thought the thing to do when people are trying to attack you and silence you is not to be silenced if you can help it. In my country, walking by the waters, down where an honest river shakes hands with the sea, a woman passed round me in a slow, watchful circle, as if I were a superstition or the worst dregs of her imagination. So, when she finally spoke, her words spliced into bars of an old wheel, a segment of air. Where do you come from? Here. I said, here, these parts. I think that if you live in a country that you feel you belong to and that you love, and then people ask you where you're from all the time and treat that country as if it doesn't belong to you, then it's deeply hurtful. Scotland, you're no mine and I don't want you. So go ahead, say I don't belong with your sepia tinge cross eyes sweeping over all that swept away, blood stained, sweat stained sugar for your tablet, your macaroon, your rotten, greedy, thieving bastard. You sit atop all that shite and broken bones weeping. Poor me. Fuck you. I will dance jigs on your flags, blue and white, blue, white and red. It doesn't fucking matter, but your wee chance of for making us complicit, handing us whip and chain, an officer's coat, a civil service pen, a queen to love and lay me out. I love you. With all your mountain tide and your curian and you can say I didn't belong to you. Aye, go on. But I am limpet stuck on you, so fuck you for no seeing one of your own. I will hear, I will spill here. My blood and your secrets bleed into you, root and earth, and you forever pagan will in the seep and the spill see all you really are. So fuck you, my sweet forgetful Caledonia will love. Fuck you. It's a love poem to Scotland, yeah, it's a love but it's a love poem like the best love poems that acknowledges somebody's flaws, but you still really love each other. Mm. And so you're left in absolutely no doubt at the end of that poem, even though you're saying, fuck you every couple of what lies, that you're left in no doubt of how passionately you love your country. It's really good to hear you say that because I've always felt that Scotland, you know, mine was written as a love poem. I was very vulnerable when I was writing it because I felt for a long time, especially growing up, it felt quite a complicated identity to sort of own. It didn't feel like one that really included me. Loving someone, like loving a place, is being able to love the whole multifaceted, complex mess that we all are, and just the be honest. The Hill Clan Jamfrey, Hugh McDermott would call it. <laughs> yeah, the Hill Clan Jamfrey. And I remember when I read your poem in my country, how powerful it felt, because it felt like it was the poem that I'd been trying to write for a long time. What inspired you, what drove you to write in my country? What was the... By so many people stopping and asking me where I'm from in my own country, mm. they'd be so busy seeing my face that they wouldn't hear my accent, basically. And so I'd have people saying to me, like, are you over from America, dear? And just that kind of thing. I mean, I remember my dad coming back one time to me and saying, what a laugh, what a laugh on the day, Jackie. I just said, this man in a turban speaking broadcast region. Mm. And I said, Dad, people think that I'm funny. And he, didn't, he couldn't see it because I was his daughter. And he, although he was a different colour than me, I said, it's really not funny. Christ, you take things too seriously, you're a prickly porcupine. Mm. I said, no, I'm not a prickly porcupine. I'm just challenging you about that. I think the pain of, of being constantly questioned about your right to belong or right to claim an identity feels still very real and very current. And sometimes I feel like being an artist or being a writer, 
there is something really important about feeling like you're the observer and you're on the outside. So there's something of a kind of a gift of being kind of mixed race or I'm quite enjoying the term fusion at the moment. I think oh, I might fusion. call myself fusion. Um, <laughs> fused. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a fusion. fusion. Yeah. But, um, this is a really fascinating place. But what drew you to having well, us here? I spend a lot of my time walking around the harbours in Dunbar and it feels like a place that is on the edge of the world in some ways. And I think also that Dunbar is the place where my life happens in the terms of this is where I'm mum and this is family and this is friendship. And I think it's a place I feel I belong. And that's taken a long time to find somewhere like that. I love the idea that it takes us a while to come into belonging to a place and that that is a journey. When we consider Scottish history, it never stopped. It reached out. It's never, nothing stopped at the borders. And this idea that Scotland stretched to, to meet my family in Jamaica and it stretched to meet my family in India and Burma, that, we were, that there was something... There was something of this place that was always present in all of my, my DNA and my history. And I think that suddenly allowed me to claim my space here with a lot more kind of power and, and, and not be apologetic about it and not feel like um, that I only ever existed on the margins, that, I would, that my family history was quite central to what made this country. I've certainly found that it's been a long journey. To, it actually took me becoming the macker mm. <laughs> to feel properly like... I belong to my country and I, I always think that's a bit extreme because it's not something you can recommend to every black Scottish person. No, Just no. become the macro, that'll sort you out. And isn't it interesting that because there are not that many black Scottish women about the place, um, that you end up kind of looking for your inspiration outside? No, yeah, I, was, I, remember I was deeply influenced by um, Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and also yourself. You being our maca is a huge thing for women of colour to see you representing us and representing poetry and words and the way in which you embrace and are embraced by this country. It's a hugely hopeful, inspiring appointment. So yes, we have felt the need to look for our wise women beyond our shores, but I think that my generation were lucky to have you, oh, you know? That's but, but nice. I, but it's funny because, you know, a lot of Scottish people I've noticed if somebody's saying lovely things like that to them, they try and stop them. They can't handle a compliment. I actually can take compliments quite well. Oh, I'll give you more. <laughs> it, must, it, must, it must be the Nigerian in me. <laughs> because because Nigerian people, if you pay them a compliment, they go, oh, really, tell me more. <laughs> I think that poetry is always in search of the truth. Not necessarily the actual truth, but the imaginative truth. And every poet that I know, whose work I admire, are all looking for some kind of true voice. Um, pioneers don't just live in their own time, they speak to the times ahead of them. Margaret Tate was a poet and filmmaker born in Kirkwall in Orkney in 1918. She produced over 30 films and she was the first woman Scottish filmmaker to do a full length feature. She is one of these visionaries, a film poet, a pioneer, a one-off. Look into all that is illuminated by the light and see the notes, songs and words and colour, and sleep, all the colours and all the dreams there in the beam. A beam of notes, a chord of colours, white music, melodious light, sparkling, spangling, skin-pricking brave sun, the light, the banner, the blush, the notes themselves, the own person's own self, perceiving the light and making the music. Well, it's lovely to be with you, Gerda. It's great to be here. I think that Margaret Chase is one of the great thinkers, writers, poets, and poet filmmakers of the 20th century. I think her whole life as an artist is inspiring because she did do it alone. She was beyond categories, really. Yeah, and that's fascinating because I think she is somebody, Margaret Tate, whose work you need to look at as a whole, 
because she saw films as a kind of poetry and poetry yes. as a kind of a film. She called them film poems. Exactly. Her poems seemed to come from a kind of a stream of consciousness, a, 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 li a live process where we're actually, it's almost like we've been invited into not just her brains, but her brain cells. It's not like the poetry of anybody else I've read. I would say. I can't, I can't think of another poet whose work is like Margaret Tate's. She started out as a scientist. She trained as a doctor and worked as an, an army doctor in the Second World War and she was out in India. And then she went to study film in Rome, which she loved. And then she became a, a filmmaker. It's okay. Come on into the picture. It's you I'm filming. I like to introduce the atmosphere of somebody being there behind the camera as well as in front of the camera. I'm just using the camera in a way as a sort of extension of myself. I think with Margaret, what you're seeing often in her work is an actual process. She was profoundly experimental as a filmmaker and as a poet, I would say. And she was the first Scottish woman to direct a feature-length film with her debut, Blue, Black, Permanent, which you starred in. This is where my mother died. When I read the script, I knew straight away that I wanted to play the character of Greta, who is the poet. You look a bit like Margaret Date, isn't it? Even the name's quite and similar to I know, name. I know. <laughs> In her writing, you can see motifs that appear in her films and her poetry, so you can see these things coming up again and again. I love one called Storms. And in Storms, it's like the scene from Blue Black Permanent. I wished for a storm to test my strength against. I cried for the gale force wind, for electric explosions, for sheets of rain. I looked to the motionless wisps of cloud, to the serene blue of the sky, and wished them transformed. I wished to be battered and to emerge triumphant. I love the beating heat of the uncovered sun and the magic stillness of a wet evening after rain and a calm of the sea which makes it look like heavy, melted, deep-coloured stuff. I think she's an innovator. I think her poetry is very different. There's something quite stark about it. It's sometimes very objective, just um, stating facts. There's the scientist's eye. I, I peer at things, I think. I, I really peer at things through my camera. I'm, I frame it for myself through the viewfinder and see it differently, you see. You peer at it more closely, I think. Do you think that she actually knew her own worth? I think she did, because she was so single-minded and determined. I don't think she was by nature a collaborator. She was very much a soloist. The minute there was a whiff of the establishment getting involved in her work, she backed right off. It's interesting, Gerda, because Richard DeMarco, um, who founded the Traverse Theatre, was also a huge admirer of Margaret Tate's work. And he wrote in a letter to Sean Connery, you know already how highly I regard Margaret Tate and her work. She's a classic example of a first-class Scot living here and being ignored with something significant to say to the whole world about Scotland. Do you feel that there are writers that have been ignored for, for years because we've had this intense focus on, on Burns. Yes, I think that's true, definitely. And I think that Scotland hasn't always had the confidence, the self-confidence to say, here is another of our wonderful artists. It has to wait till that artist is, is kind of um, given recognition abroad or somewhere else before we can go, oh right, yeah, that, 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 that person's great. <laughs> But there she is looking into the future, it seems. Absolutely. With great confidence, as if she knows that we're sat here right now looking at her, looking into yes. the future. But she had that extraordinary kind of self-belief. I think that's quite inspiring to be able to say, no, 
I'm, I'm doing this my way, it's my story. Scotland takes poetry seriously. There are probably more poets per square mile in Scotland than just about any country in the world. We've also got a huge amount of really wonderful Gaelic poets. For a small country, we really punch above our weight. If my life Lee had taught, if my life Yesh would have closed, I got a fan, the sheen and from a lehu, me and Molly, got three hardly close to Joy, Sagrion Gavor, got glasses at nine and ran, Uting, a Hanukkah door, got glass out there, at the tail door, so he strikes Bunshu, the Yachtri Abada. At Mohulu had yes, for whom glass, so ain't it as a grain, and the Dunya and Yachtri. And a Nurton, a Lekin, and Shesu. In Fianish na tota is na mara, hasul se viel for, yachtri e dolem fur ves. Bosta Beach is one of the most beautiful beaches in the Hebrides, and that is saying something. This is the Isle of Burner. America is a little bit over there. So Don Macaulay is a great example of a Gaelic poet from here. He loved this beach. He was from Bernera. And he was a writer who wrote with real principle and integrity. But like so many of the poets from our part of the world and our people from this part of the world, he's othered. He's the marginalised of the marginalised. If he's mentioned at all in academic, for example, or general works of literature, it's almost as a footnote or a footnote to a footnote. But I find it really fascinating, the idea that the poetry, say, of Donald Macaulay speaks to your inner self, to your soul, and bolsters you and gives you the courage to be who you are. It takes courage, first of all, to be a writer if you, if you grow up in Lewis, and especially in his generation, because that's not the kind of thing people did. It wasn't expected of you. I mean, he was a terrific academic as well. But what makes him individual is a kind of, a really beautiful balance between intellectualism, originality and heart. There's passion in there, there's real humanity in there. And to have those things connected to landscape and culture in the way that he did it, I don't think anybody else has done it in quite the same way. And who are the poets that you think are unsung heroes from this part of the world, from the Hebrides? All of them are unsung heroes, but unsung is a good, is a good word to use because traditionally poems were sung to help with usually quite rhythmical daily tasks, like rowing boats, there were rowing songs, walking songs, that's W-A-U-L-K, walking the tweed. The women would walk the tweed and sing to lighten the workload and they have a certain rhythm and the the songs that they sung were poems quite often relating to local events or local characters and it made the task both communal and enjoyable. Those kind of walking songs remind me of the African-American tradition of work songs that, that uh, slaves would sing in the fields and then there would be work songs and there would be songs that would be passed down and down and down and, tra and then transfer into blues and then that would become into jazz and, and Gaelic's the same in that, in that way. I think that's a really good analogy because Don Macaulay for me would be the equivalent of a phenomenal jazz singer that not everybody knows about but all the jazz singers would rate as the jazz singer. Ian Crichton Smith said that Lewis is a question mark that follows me around at the back of my mind. Lewis was with him wherever he went in the world. It gave me the confidence to think that I could be a writer and that all, all the things that I needed were here around me, elementally, but also the intangible aspects of community. These are all here. They're there in the best writing of Donald Macaulay, of Ian Crichton Smith, all the great poets and Freighter. It's all within their writing. It's intrinsically connected to here. We would all be entirely different writers 
if we weren't from here and didn't have that connection with, with the place. Svartje fjärg in från Riesk, en stad. Friävig en fröjje har jolteg en jarrug, gjärske mig en harasker. Friävig en ekiel gjel och skål, krönjöch och slochlanoch, så att kolag skjes från en sjöran. Låroch gach bon och hosig en munchig, kjol gach kanan och kjol och gjej, blås gach krya i kjolet tro ächtri. Sie gehen nicht in die Höhe hin. Ein Luschkes. It's amazing to be here in this extraordinary building. Well, this is the Eye Church. Uh, it dates back to the 13th century. It was the burial place of the MacLeods of Lewis, so it was the, the main church in the island. I'm just wondering, what is it particularly about this extraordinary landscape in Lewis that makes inspires people to write poetry? There's big sky. There's uh, there's nothing crowding in on you. Ian Crichton Smith, in one of his poems, said that it was the bare beauty of of Lewis that brought his poetry to life. There's space to think. I'm kind of fascinated with the oral tradition in Gaelic poetry. We t tend to think of poetry and song and how many poems are songs and how many songs are, <laughs> are poems. And in the Gaelic culture, there isn't necessarily such a dividing line between the two. Uh, Sorley MacLean once said that you could sometimes read poetry and you could almost hear the tune in your head, that the, the tune and the words are so intertwined that it's hard to uh, kind of split the two. Gaelic poetry was song. When I was growing up, I read the poetry of Derek Thompson and Ian Crichton Smith, but they were far away academic scholars. But in the village, there were song makers who I knew, I grew up with. It was from them that I realised that poetry was for the likes of me. And in Gaelic culture, people weren't just a poet, they, they were crofter fishermen, <laughs> mothers' wives, you know, and, and poetry was, was, it was the accompaniment to everything that they did. I think what's still very much alive and well in the Gaelic community is that people all over are still composing and it is very much part of the, the culture. Stack Polly, Cool Beg, Coolmore, Sulvin, Canis, a frieze, and a litany. Who owns this landscape? Has owning anything to do with love? For it and I have a love affair, so nearly human we even have quarrels. When I intrude too confidently, it rebuffs me with a wind like a hand or put in my way a quaking bog or a loch where no loch should be. Or I turn stonily away, refusing to notice the rouge rocks, the mascara under a dripping ledge, even the toss, the stony limbs waiting. I can't pretend it gets sick for me in my absence, though I get sick for it. Who owns this landscape? The millionaire who bought it, or the poacher staggering downhill in the early morning with a deer on his back, who possesses this landscape, the man who bought it, or I who am possessed by it. The marvellous mountains in Norman McCaig's A Man in Assen are right behind me. You know, there used to be a myth, a Norse myth, that these mountains were just taken up and plumped down by the gods. And when you're in this landscape, you can, you can feel it, you can see it. It's savage, it's kind, it's beautiful. You can mirror yourself against the landscape, as McCaig did over and over and over, and hold it up to yourself and ask yourself many questions about yourself, about death, about love, about life, about grief, all sorts of different things. And this land seems to let you do it all.
Norman McCaig was a beloved presence in the Scottish poetry scene for years. He was one of these poets that uh, to spend time in his company felt like a huge privilege, but he wouldn't have even liked you saying that. <laughs> he said, oh. <laughs> He was born in Edinburgh in 1910, and he loved Edinburgh, um, but you'd probably say his heart was in the Highlands, and he would return again and again to a place called Ascent that was really, probably represented the core of him. He actually felt as if in his poems, the land was a kind of a character. Landscape to me is my substitute for religion and politics and such trifles. I know when I'm in a landscape, especially a wildish one, I feel extraordinary at home. The thing I love about that particular poem, A Man in Ascent, is that Norman McCaig is very aware of his own mortality in it, and he's aware that he's tiny, tiny, tiny up against this bloody ge geological kind of marvel, and yet he wants to have a conversation. It takes you through his entire philosophy, and if you weren't able to read a single other thing by Norman McCaig, and you could only read one poem, then I would read that poem. My dad was a huge fan of Norman McCaig. And a couple of days before my dad died, I went to visit him in, in hospital and he quoted McCaig's poem. And my dad went, aye, aye, that's right, that's right. Who owns this landscape? And does owning it have anything to do with love? And so it seems extraordinary to me that the last time that I saw my dad in this world, he was talking about Norman McCaig and his poetry. But it's the idea that even the dead own the landscape and that even the dead are part of it. And that's, that's a really comforting thought. It just made me think again as if I didn't know already just what a huge part poetry plays in our lives. That, uh, that there it is, you know, at the beginning of your life, hopefully, and there it is at the end of your life. I see poetry as part of the national conversation. Poetry should be part of the blethering about who we are and what we want to do with our lives. It shouldn't be something that's away off in the corner and that nobody understands. I really believe that poetry holds up a mirror to a nation's heart and soul. Poetry is the language of being human. <laughs>